Attention students of ICC class 9 and 10 and intermediate first year. Do subscribe to study with Sudhir YouTube channel where we cover English literature, history, civics, geography, biology and English grammar and many important motivational videos too. Don't forget to click on the bell icon so that you can get regular updates. Hello and welcome to the study with Suthi channel and today we are going to be looking at history but before we get started do remember to subscribe to the channel to spread the word among your friends and classmates as we cover the different subjects of the ICSE class 9 and class 10 syllabus. Today we are going to be looking at United Nations. We have already covered the first world war, this rise of the two dictators that is Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler and the dramatic events of the second world war. What was the biggest fallout? the consequence of the second world war that was the establishment of the united nations so today we are going to be talking about that in particular so after a bitter experience of two world wars which spanned a time period of close to 25 years from 1914 to 1945 more than 25 years in fact the world leaders realized that you needed an organization an impartial neutral organization jo ki ye koshish kar sakti thi ki vishwa mein is tarah ke bade bade yudh na ho so that these kind of big destructive world wars did not take place and that resulted in a meeting at San Francisco on October 24, 1945 in the form of United Nations organization. That is when the UNO came into existence. Now, we will first look at the reasons for the establishment of the United Nations and later on in the video lesson, we will be looking at the different wings of the United Nations. What does the General Assembly do? What does the Security Council do? What is the role um, of the different organs of the United Nations? So, we will be looking at it all in detail, but let us look at the reasons for the establishment of the United Nations. Tip number one, this can come as a question in the paper. So, please pay attention because these are important and the first important reason is the disastrous world war. The first world war led to the formation of the League of Nations in 1920. That was not a success because obviously could not do anything to prevent the outbreak of the second world war in 1939. So they had lessons to learn from the failure of the League of Nations. Also, the disastrous world war meant that the two wars had cost billions of dollars. So many people had died. 50 million people had died of which 22 million was just soldiers and 28 million civilians had died. Many people had become unemployed. There was large scale destruction of property. So they started thinking in terms of an international organization to maintain world peace. So that is reason number one. The reason number two, as I just mentioned, was the failure of the League of Nations. The third reason is the fear of a third world war because obviously they could not want a situation, desire a situation where another world war broke out involving different countries not just in Europe but also in other continents like Asia and perhaps even North and South America. Then uh, there was also the fear that a third world war would lead to the end of the world as it is. Okay. The reason number four was the division of the world into two power blocks as we discussed in the chapter when we were discussing the second world war was that the, there are two blocks, one led by the USA and one led by the USSR. So there was a, some kind of a cold war which took place between these two countries and the two blocks in general. So they therefore had no faith in each other. There was a major what we call a trust deficit. So they wanted a neutral organization that would be able to maintain world peace by talking to both the power blocks and both the countries that is the USA and the USSR. The USSR now of course is broken into several other countries like Ukraine, Russia, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, uh, um, uh, Kyrgyzstan etc. Reason number five was the destructive weapons because the destructive weapons like atom bombs which are dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the second world war in Japan basically led the people to believe, led the world leaders to believe that now many countries are in possession of such arms which could actually destroy the entire world. So again the maintenance of world peace became so much more important. Those are the five reasons for the establishment of the United Nations. Now how did the UN 
come into existence then in the first place. Now, as I said, the San Francisco conference was held in October 1945 and the charter was signed by 50 participating countries and uh, the charter was ratified by 29 nations and October 24 is when it is celebrated as United Nations Day. This can also come as a short two mark answer. Now, the objectives of the United Nations, that is another part which you need to know because you have established an organization fine but how is it different from the League of Nations and what really are its objectives. The main objective of the United Nations was to maintain international peace and security, the main reason just like the League of Nations. The number two reason which is why the UNO is a much more of a holistic organization, much more a well-rounded organization than the League of Nations was because League of Nations one of the biggest drawbacks and this can also come as a question if you want to be asked the difference between the League of Nations and the UN. The League of Nations did not have many powerful countries like the USA or Germany as its members and the entire thing was involved revolving around the Treaty of Versailles where the feeling of revenge was much more strong against Germany. UN was not like that. They wanted to carry everyone together because they really felt the need and the importance and the significance of maintaining world peace. Vishwa mein shanti ho, uski taraf puri tarah se koshish ki gai is UNO ke ko sthapit karne ke baad. The reason number two, the objective number two was to develop friendly relations among nations based on mutual respect. In, in the earlier part between 1920 and 1939 there was no mutual respect in fact there was suspicion and a feeling of revenge but here the objective was that it should be based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of people. The third objective was to achieve international cooperation in solving economic, social and humanitarian problems. So the, the, the effort would be to solve different problems of the world. Then also to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations in the sense that have a more harmonious relationship among member countries. So the three the objectives apart from these four was basically the three D's. The three D's were disarm, decolonize and develop. Disarm that is not everybody is not going to have those huge stockpiles of armaments which again was one of the reasons which led to the second world war. Number two decolonize that countries will not have these colonies where they would inflict um, um, you know cruel behavior and ill treat the people of that uh, country and number three develop everybody should be allowed to develop their economies and become better countries so the three d's were really the cornerstone of the united nations charter what were the principles of the united nations to respect the sovereign equality of all its members that they should settle their dispute by peaceful means they should refrain from use of threat or use of power against any other member state and the United Nations will not intervene in any kind of domestic dispute. That is the internal affairs of any state that what is happening say for instance in India or what is happening in say in France, the UN will not interfere in the domestic affairs of that state but it will only come into the picture when A is having a problem with B and B is having a problem with C. That's when the UN will come into picture and will try to settle international disputes, not domestic disputes, international disputes by peaceful means. Now the headquarters of the UN is established in the city of New York in the USA. Uh, in fact, all the organs of United Nations are based in New York except for the International Court of Justice which is based in Hague in the, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we talk about the UN, in fact this is one of the questions which has been asked in the, one of the previous exam papers of showing the flag and asking what is this flag and what are the colors. So the UN flag is light blue in color and it has a white uh, the thing in the emblem at the center and it is a polar map of the world embraced by twin olive branches. Olive branch, why an olive branch? Because you always say that if I am extending an olive branch to you, it means that I am extending a hand of friendship. Olive branch is symbolic of a hand of friendship. So it has the symbol of the olive branch along a polar map of the world and it was adopted on the 20th of October 1947. The flag was adopted two years, almost two years after the UN came into existence on the 24th of October 1945. The flag was adopted on the 20th of October 1947. Okay. Now uh, the official languages of the Union, uh, United Nations are six um, languages which are fr uh, 
French, Arabic, um, Chinese, English, Russian and Spanish. How do you remember it? I have a small acronym for it which I call FARSES. FARS S. So fra FARSES, F for French, A for Arabic, R for Russian, C for Chinese, E for English and S for Spanish. This is an easy way. If you just remember UN and just remember the word FARS and add an S, you will be able to remember which are the six languages which are the official languages of the United Nations. These are all simple gimmicks to remember things because obviously the brain also needs to process. So once you have you remember farces, you will always be able to expand it and remember the six official languages of the United Nations. But the, the, the uh, working languages are only two which is English and French. Uh, the, uh, all the member countries contribute and that is how the United Nations is run in the New, in New York City of United States of America. Now the membership is also open to all the peace loving countries in the world, right? Uh, so that is there and uh, 193 countries were its members by the year 2011 and at that time Sudan was its last member, South Sudan was the last member to be admitted to the UN in 2011. Uh, India was one of the 50 members who took part in the San Francisco conference even though India was not an independent country by then. It was two years before, one and a half years before it became independent but it was an original member of the United Nations. Now which are the six organs of the United Nations which is the General Assembly, the Security Council, the International Court of Justice. These are the three main organs but apart from that you also have the Economic and Social Council, the Trusteeship Council and the Secretariat. But the first three, the General Assembly, the Security Council and the ICJ, the International Court of Justice which you must have heard very recently when India actually took the uh, took Pakistan to the International Court of Justice in the Kulbushan Jadav case. So that's when you would have actually heard a lot of it, um, uh, Indian lawyers going and fighting the case out there in uh, Hague, in the Hague at the International Court of Justice and winning the case. The first one, the General Assembly. Now that is the main legislative, the main deliberative organ of the United Nations. Okay, And its composition is all the members of the United Nations or uh, all the members of the United Nations are also the members of the General Assembly and every year in the month of September you, you would have seen it even this year all uh, um, heads of state going and actually de delivering their speeches at the United Nations. Now each state has five representatives in the General Assembly but the vote is only one. Now the regular session uh, begins in uh, as I said in the month of Tuesday and goes on um, uh, till the month of December and uh, they elect a new president, 21 vice presidents and the chairman of the assemblies, the general assemblies, six main committees. Now this is generally the composition of the administrative wing of the United Nations. Okay, So uh, that is there and then the powers and functions of the general assembly something again which you would need to know. Uh, basically to say that to make recommendations for the peaceful settlement of disputes to discuss and make recommendations on any question within the scope of the charter or affecting the powers and functions of any organ of the United Nations. Uh, it also needs to pass the budget of the United Nations in order to ensure that it is uh, working and working properly. The most important uh, power and function of the General Assembly is to appoint the Secretary General of the United Nations on the recommendation of the Security Council. So here is where the two get intertwined. On the recommendation of the Security Council is how the Secretary General of the United Nations is elected by the General Assembly. Um, an important point um, was uh, happened in 1950 uh, under the Uniting for Peace resolution adopted by the General Assembly in October 19, November 1950, the Assembly may take action if the Security Council fails to act in a case where there seems to be a threat to peace, breach of peace or act of aggression. So even in cases. Even in the rare case where the Security Council fails to act, the General Assembly can actually act in a particular case when there is a dispute between two countries or if there is a serious threat to world peace. So the Assembly in that case is empowered. So this can come under what circumstances which is called the Uniting for Peace Resolution. Under what circumstances can the General Assembly do take action even if the Security Council fails to take action and this is what the Uniting for Peace resolution adopted in November 1950 that is five years after the UN came into existence. We now come to the 
Security Council. Now, this is really the powerful body within the United Nations. Now, it is the executive body. That was the legislative body. This is the executive body because it 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 it's, it, it it has a representative of each of its members must be present at all times in the United Nations and it has a primary responsibility of maintenance of international peace and security. Now, importantly, it consists of 15 members and India has been trying to become a permanent member of the Security Council for many years. It has been lobbying very hard without success so far. So, it consists of the council consists of 15 members of which 5 members are permanent members which is the USA, the U Russia now, earlier it was USSR, USA, Russia, England, France and China, right? Uh, and this is important, we will we'll come to why these 5 permanent members are important. Apart from that, there are 10 other members which consists of 5 Afro-Asian countries that is representatives from both Africa and Asian countries, two Latin American countries, okay, two Latin American countries, two West European countries and one East European country. So that makes up the remaining 10. So the 15 member composition, 5 permanent and 10 on a rotational basis. Now the 10 non-permanent members are elected by the General Assembly by a two-third majority for a period of, for a term of two years. So these 10 members are members of the Security Council for a term of two members, but they are not permanent members, right? Uh, and that's how they are elected by the General Assembly, by a two-third majority. And uh, the presidency of the council rotates monthly, that is the president of the Security Council is there only for a month and it rotates according to the English alphabetical order, so A, B, C, D. Why the five members, permanent members are so important is because they have the veto power. Now, what is a veto power? Now, each member of the Security Council has one vote, but the negative vote of a permanent member is called a veto. The council is powerless to act if any of the five permanent members uses the veto power. And this happens many times. For instance, even in cases involving India and Pakistan, China has used its veto power to protect Pakistan. That has happened many times. So it can be very frustrating, but this is a power which is given to the five permanent members right from the time when the United Nations came into existence. So this many feel is actually an un makes it a little unequal in the scheme of things that because one permanent member is able to use its veto power and it's not even by a majority. It is most of the cases one is to four as it has happened whenever China has used its veto power to favor Pakistan in the Security Council. But even then, that particular motion cannot go through because one of the permanent members has used its veto power. So the veto power, extremely important. This again comes as a question as to what is veto power and how does it really work within the Security Council and who are the five permanent members of the Security Council. Now, what are the powers and functions of the Security Council? Again, to maintain international peace and security, it needs to um, formulate plans for the establishment of a system to regulate armaments because it obviously does not want to encourage these stockpiles of armaments. Uh, it also calls on members to apply economic sanctions because that is something which is done quite frequently when it sees a country like a rogue country like say for instance um, it has happened with Iraq, it has happened with several other countries in the Middle East whenever they felt that a particular country's policies were detrimental to the peace of the entire world they first apply economic sanctions. So, it, there is an economic blockade. They, um, um, they do not, uh, they are not able to sell, they import their goods. They are not able to export their goods. They cannot import stuff from other countries. So, there is that kind of an economic blockade which affects the social life and the economic prosperity of people and business in that country. So, that is the first way in order to exert pressure on a country which is not doing the right thing. Uh, it, it also empowers them to take military action against an aggressor which again has happened against countries like Iraq and Iran and Syria in the recent past. It recommends the admission of new members and also on the recommendation of the Security Council is how the new uh, Secretary General of the United Nations is elected. So that is very very important. It also uh, elects the judges of the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Then we come to the International Court of Justice, the Hague, which is the third most important organ of the United Nations. Now, it is uh, there in Hague right from 1946 and it has a dual role. Now, it, it settles in accordance with the international law, the legal disputes submitted to it by the states, by the different countries and to also give advisory opinion on legal questions referred to it by 
international organs and agencies. So it has this, uh, it has to give advice and also, also to settle disputes as happened in the Kulbushan Jadav case. Now the court consists of 15 judges. The court consists of 15 judges and they are all for 9 year terms. Each judge is there for a 9 year term. Okay. And uh, it may not include more than one judge from one particular country. So one country can at best have only one judge in that uh, international court of justice among those 15 judges and uh, they do not represent their government so if there is an indian judge out there he is not representing he is not representing india but he is there as an independent member an imp independent judge of the international court of justice and the court also elects its own president and vice president for a 3 year term basically take care of the administration of the international court of justice now uh, there is something called the compulsory jurisdiction of the icj which basically takes care of the number of treaties uh, which are, which govern the disputes which are submitted to the court and its jurisdiction extends to disputes pertaining to the interpretation of international law whenever there is some kind of a violation of international law especially when it comes to maritime boundaries and stuff like that or compensation which has to be made for a breach for a violation of international law it also gives advisory opinions whenever it is sought by independent countries and also to any of the other agencies of the United Nations. Uh, that is the thing and uh, of course now the new Secretary General that can also come as a new as a question as to who is the Secretary General of the United Nations. This is a bit like a general knowledge question. The new Secretary General is Antonio Guterres who was the Prime Minister of Portugal in the past. So he is a politician, a powerful politician in his own right in his country and he is now the Secretary General of the United Nations. Then of course there is the Secretariat which is the administrative wing of the United Nations. Uh, it consists of the Secretary General and the Office of the Secretary General and takes care of the coordination and the supervision of all the activities that are taking place within the United Nations. So that's essentially as far as the United Nations chapter is concerned. Um, we'll just go through if there are any more interesting points which you would need to know about the UN because we will be looking at the different other organs of the United Nations in a separate uh, chapter. The interesting part is that Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, we just spoke about how the Security Council has its own president etc. So Vijay Lakshmi Pandit was the first woman president of the uh, United of the General Assembly in 1953-1954 of the General Assembly, beg your pardon. Uh, she was the first woman president. Also uh, the WHO and UNESCO and UNICEF will be reading in a separate video lesson. Uh, presently as I said 193 members are there but apart from that you also have Palestine which was added on as another member of the United Nations. So uh, that's pretty much the United Nations important chapter because you do get questions which are pretty much uh, about the role of the uh, this peace agency that was formed as to when it was formed, what are the functions, under what circumstances it was formed, the reasons for the establishment of the UN extremely important which we did write at the beginning of the video lesson and there could be the small small questions about what is the veto power, under what circumstances it is used, under what circumstances can the United Nations General Assembly go against the recommendations or go against the Security Council. So you need to know this in a rather holistic manner but definitely an important lesson and more importantly an important um, fallout of the Second World War which is actually playing an important role to this day in 2019. That's it then on this chapter. As I said right at the beginning, please subscribe to study with Sudhir and we'll see you with the other chapters of the history syllabus in the ICSC class 10. Thank you very much for watching.